those around us. We worship you with all of our hearts. Oh, join me as we sing tonight. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Welcome to Online Church tonight. We are so blessed to have you here with us. On behalf of Jennifer and everybody here at the staff, we know you had a very Merry Christmas, and we believe you're going to have a great and happy New Year's. We want to make sure and invite you this Sunday night. We're going to have a special time of prayer, so I encourage you to come Sunday morning, Sunday night, 6 o'clock. We're going to have some prayer meetings some time. We'll watch your children have everything ready for you. So just make plans to be here for that. We want to welcome you tonight. We decided that we would just have church online because of the week of Christmas and everything that's happening. A lot of people traveling, all the things that go along with this season of time. And so we thought this would be the simplest way to uh, let everybody be a participant in church tonight. So welcome. We do want to encourage you while you're watching tonight, if you'd like to give your tithes, and your offerings, of course, you'll have to do it electronically. And on the screen, you'll be able to see the different ways you can give through the website on Cash App. You can give uh, through the app if you have the app downloaded. You can also mail your check to P.O. Box 348, Broken Arrow, Oklahoma 74013. That will be on the screen as always. And uh, just thank you for your faithfulness. We only have two more services till the end of the year. So if you've got pledges out there you'd like to make and you haven't been able to do that yet, you're getting down to the wire. So if you want to do that electronically, of course, you're welcome to do that. We'll remind you again as we get to the end of the service and we want to pray a blessing over your giving. But tonight I want to thank you for being here and joining with us online. And I have something the Lord has put on my heart to just encourage you tonight about expecting God's best. So let's pray and get into the word tonight. If you are watching, make sure you have your Bible. Get ready to take some notes, shut down the distractions, and let's focus our heart and mind on what God would have to say to us tonight. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we welcome your spirit into our homes. Wherever we are tonight, we welcome you. We focus our heart and mind to receive and to hear the wisdom of your word. Guide, lead, direct, instruct, and correct our hearts as we yield and surrender ourselves to you tonight. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. 
Well, you know, as I was thinking about God's best, I am reminded of a very charismatic statement, but it is a truth of the character of God, and that is this, God is a good God. You know, we say that oftentimes in jest and in our very religious phrases, we love to throw that around, but God is a good God. It is his nature, it is his character, it's not just a cliché. God is good, and He is a good God, as we often say, all the time. And I want to remind you tonight just how good God is by using an example of Abraham. Abraham is a tremendous example of God's goodness. And we all know the story of Abraham. He is the father of faith, and all the journey that his life is, and to us as an example, and a hero of faith. But tonight I want to look at a very specific example in the life of Abraham. God said to Abraham many things that he was to do throughout the journey of his life. And as we look and study the life of Abraham, you'll see Abraham's growth of faith and confidence and expectation. And it's much like our own journey in our spiritual walk. As we live and are obedient and are doers of God's word, we see our faith grow and that belief and that expectation of God's word increase. And that happened also in Abraham's life. Abraham got to a place where it wasn't just a belief in his heart, but he has an honest expectation of God's goodness and God's manifestation in his life. And when Abraham, as we remember, was an elderly man with his wife, Sarah, we would call them senior citizens today, God spoke to their heart to have a child. And you remember the story, when God spoke to Sarah, she laughed. And, uh, but God was faithful, and by the time she was 99 years old, Sarah gave birth to a son. And in Genesis 13, it tells us God promised Abraham that that offspring would be numerous as the dust of the air. Remember how he would tell Abraham to count the sand and to count the stars and that it was a reminder to Abraham of the offspring that would come from Isaac. But there was a season in Abraham's life where a test showed up. And just like many of us, as we journey through life, tests show up. Things happen unexpectedly. Maybe God begins to speak to you to do something you weren't planning on doing. You were going one way and then God said, nope, time to go a different direction. And it's in those seasons of what we would call testing that we find Abraham. And as we, many of us, have heard this story, it is evident in the story that Abraham had a tremendous trust and obedience, and an expectation of God's power in his life. And in Genesis 22, we find God is commanded to kill Isaac. I mean, that's a pretty major test in the life of Abraham. All that God has done, 25 years of God's faithfulness, and and Isaac shows up. And then Isaac is now a young man, and here we are testing again. And in Hebrews chapter 11... Verse 17 through 19, we see the story unfold. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promise offered up his only begotten son, of whom it is said in verse 18, In Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise up even from the dead. Here is the story that we know of Abraham and Isaac. But what I want to look at tonight is the spiritual perspective of what's happening here. In this picture of Hebrews, we get into the mindset of Abraham. How Abraham was not only blindly obedient, but Abraham had a determined mind, a focused heart, that God would do something miraculous in his obedience. So what did he do? He had faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, so this moment comes, Abraham goes through this moment in faith. Why? Because he had this mind. Notice in verse 19, it says, concluding that God was able. How do you conclude? You make a conclusion in your mind. You decide something that that's what you're going to do, and you conclude that that's how it's going to work. That's what uh, Abraham did here. Abraham concluded in his mind. He had a focused mind because his faith was in God's call. And his faith was in obedience to do what God called. 
him to do in that moment. Yes, it was a test. Yes, it was a dramatic thing, but, but, but Abraham decided in his mind, God, who gave me this child, can also raise him from the dead. So I'm going to obey, and I'm going to determine in my mind that my obedience will produce life in a son I'm about to kill by the leading of God. The picture of this is what you need to focus your mind on as we read this story. And I want to take some time and go back to the book of Genesis where we first find this story. And we learn about how Abraham is trusting God. And even though the choices is hard, the difficulty of the life, you and I can learn from this how we are to not only trust God but to expect God's best to manifest in the seasons of testing in our own life. In Genesis 22.1 we see on the screen, now it came to pass... After these things that God tested Abraham. And he said to Abraham, and Abraham said what? Here I am. Not what do you want. Not a, that's the devil. That's not heartburn. God said to him, after, look at this, after it came to pass. Now what does that mean? Came to pass after. To me that shows that Abraham had grown to a place in his walk. That his faith was so bold in God. That his confidence was so great in God. That God could then bring this opportunity, this season, this test into Abraham. Abraham could not have done this when when, when Isaac was just a baby. Abraham had not reached this place where faith had come to an established life. See, that's where many of us struggle. We don't ever come to that place where we are resolved. We are men and women of faith. And so many of us never grow and never really mature in the things of God. And we we want to do more for God. But have we come to this place in our life where we are resolved to live by faith? We're not testing the grounds of our belief. No, Abraham had come to pass in his life. He was a man of faith. And that's critical. For many of us, we've got to resolve that we're not just playing at these things, that we're not just floundering in and out of lives that are faithful lives. But no, we are, and we are known as, and we have examples and testimonies in our life of faith in operation, faith being used. We are men and women of faith. And here's where Abraham is at. He has proven himself that that God can bring this opportunity into Abraham's life. And you got to realize this test was bigger than Abraham. Now, it was concluded that Abraham had to do it. We all agree to that. But it was bigger than that. God needed this open door to bring Jesus into the world. And he was using Abraham, a man who had proven himself a man of faith. That I'm going to use Abraham to open a door for my son to come into the world. And in verse 2, we see that Abraham, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go into the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains which I am about to tell you. Verse 3, so Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering, and he rose and went to the place which God had told him. Verse 4, then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. There's not a single indication in these verses that Abraham had the slightest hesitation or rebellion in his obedience. He blindly, faithfully, trusting wholeheartedly God. Oh man, listen to what I'm saying tonight. What is it the Lord is asking you to do right now in this season of your life? What is it God is asking you to do? Are you dragging your feet? You're still thinking about whether you want to do it? Are you asking your wife and your pastor and you, you're going to all these people to get counsel? Or are you just going to do what God tells you to do? 
split the wood, saddle the donkey, and start moving. That's what Abraham did, and that's what we have to do. Knowing that God is faithful, our mind is in the right place. We're not nervous. We're not panicking. We're not counting all the options and leaving doors open. No, you do what God says to do. And as you go, God will continue to lead your steps. Abraham didn't know where. He didn't know how far it was. He didn't know how many days it would take for him to get to that place. But God said, I'll show you. Now go. Oh, God's saying the same thing to us tonight as we watch this sermon. What is it God has challenged you to do? I'm I'm encouraging you to trust in the goodness of God and his character that he has a good plan, a successful plan for your life. Now, Abraham goes on and begins to move towards the mountain. And Abraham, believing God, is moving towards that place of of obedience. He knew that God had said to him, Isaac, you will be the son who brings the fulfillment of this generation into the world. That God will multiply the seeds of your life through Isaac. Notice that God brought Jesus Through the seed of Isaac. Why? Because God promised Abraham that he would. You and I got to have the kind of focus it takes to do what God is telling us to do. And here's the key. You know why Abraham could do it? Because he trusted God, he knew God, and he had a focused mind. And I think a lot of times that's really what it comes down to. We trust God. We know what we're supposed to do, but we can't get our mind focused on it. We get a thousand thoughts and distractions that want to cause hesitation and doubt. And that is exactly what you can't do. You cannot get your mind onto thinking about your life alone. You got to see the big picture. You got to look at the entire situation. What are you telling me to do? And that is where my mind is going to focus. I'm going to do what you say to do. And as I'm doing it, I'm trusting you. Are you following me tonight? You got to get your eyes off the issue. You got to get out of this quit mentality. Sometimes the things we must do seem overwhelming in our mind. And just like Abraham, what do we do? We keep our eye on the promise. We get it off of the hesitation, off of the worry. We don't focus on the how comes and what will happen and who will think and what others might say. Expect God to show up. Expect God to show up in your situation. Don't get your mind on the thinking All alone in life. All I am is me. I don't know if I can do it. So many of us. Set at home thinking we're the only one. Nobody will understand. Why is God asking this of me? Why would he do this to me? You know, there are a lot of people laying in a hospital tonight right now thinking God did it to them. They're waiting on God to do and remove something from their life. As if God was testing them or trying to mature them through sickness. That's not what God's doing. And that's not what God was doing here with Abraham. God wasn't testing Abraham for Abraham's sake. He was testing Abraham for all of our sakes. Because what Abraham did opened the door for Christ to come. And because Christ could come, he redeemed all of mankind. That's what Christmas is about, right? It is about the season of redemption. It is about remembering the birth and the the meaning and the season that is Jesus. Notice here also that there's no indication Abraham counseled with Sarah before going. He didn't have a little, you know, family meeting about whether we should do this. I don't see where he ever even told Sarah. Oh, by the way, I'm taking Isaac up to some strange mountain. I don't know where and I don't know when, but God told me to kill him. No, that's not the thing we need to do. Sometimes we just, we just need to talk about things we shouldn't be talking about. You know, there are things God speaks to your life about, and you just need to do it. You need to stop asking for 50 people's opinions. It's often wisdom to not speak the things you know God is speaking to your heart to do. you got to protect your faith. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not saying keep people in the dark. I'm not suggesting that you don't advise your wife or that you don't talk. Or that you don't pray with her. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that Abraham 
was being asked a difficult thing. And he needed to protect his faith and not be discouraged. He listened to his wife one time before and got an Ishmael. So this time he wasn't going to disobey God. He wasn't going to counsel with other people. You know why? Because as we said earlier, he had come to that season in life where he knew what faith was. He knew the faith he had in God. And he knew that God would bring Isaac back from the dead. So I don't need to tell her. He's coming back with me. Amen. And God is faithful to do the things that he has called you to do. And he is faithful to perform that which he has called you to do. Commit your life to God. Trust God. As this new year comes into life, don't drag your feet any longer. Trust God. This will be the best year of your life because you did what God called you to do. I believe that. I believe that for myself, and I believe I'm declaring that prophetically into your life. 2024 is going to be a great year, one of the best years in your life. Why? You did what God called you to do. Let's jump back into verse 5. Here in Genesis it says, And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here. Watch the donkeys, and the lad and I will go yonder and worship. Look at this. And we will come back to you. Again, his mind was focused. God's raising him from the dead. I'm going to do it, but God's bringing him back. We're coming back. Faith coming out of his mouth. Abraham's faith is being spoken. God never told Abraham Isaac would come off that mountain. He just knew the character of God. He knew the promises of God. Abraham only thought about the things God had promised him. A great nation is coming from my offspring. Isaac is my offspring. God, you are going to bring him back from the grave. Abraham thought about Isaac not as being dead. But knowing that even though I'm going to kill him, God is going to do a powerful work, a miraculous thing, a thing beyond what I can do within my own strength. He would never have been able to overcome the grief of the loss of Isaac had he not had the confidence that God would bring him back from the dead. He wouldn't have went through what he did if his mind had not been focused if his mind had not been constant on the promise. And again, so many truths in this point for us. When we're out there living by faith, we can't beat ourselves up in our mind. We have to stay focused on what God has said to do. Because that's what gets you through the uncertainty, the challenge of the natural. Everything in the flesh saying, bad choice. How many times has God spoken to you to give? to someone or to do something generous in a church or a ministry and everything in the world says you can't afford that don't do that that's your plan what about that and yet you know God said to do it somewhere you have to focus your mind that God has greater things for that seed than what I can do with it myself Abraham understood if I have to sow Isaac you will produce a harvest from that seed and that mindset, that focused heart, that determined attitude is what keeps us moving and motivated to be obedient when things look difficult in life. Romans 8, 6 tells us, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is what? Life and peace. Think about that. When your mind is fixated on carnal things, that's just Carnal just means flesh. So fleshly things, it'll lead to death. Death not being death as far as your heart quits beating, but death as far as obedience to God dies. Failure happens. Disobedience happens. That carnal mind will lead you to an excuse to not do. You, you, that carnal mind will get you doubting God. That carnal mind will get you into worrying about what your wife or your family or others will say. So what does he say? No, no, no. Be spiritually minded. Do you know why? Because in the spirit of the mind, there is life and peace. When my mind is in the spirit, when my mind is in the word, when my mind is in obedience to the call of God, when I am reminding myself of what God said to do, and I'm willing to do it, and I'm obedient to do it, when my mind is spiritually led that way, guess what happens? Peace that passes understanding fills my heart. Life. I have such a joy, such a hope, such an excitement in what God is about to do in a, in a dramatic way. Because I'm mindful of his word 
I'm mindful of the spirit behind what I'm doing. Oh, listen to me tonight. There is a carnal side to things, and there is a spiritual side to things. And here we are being told that while those two realities exist, where your mind is brings either death or life. Death or peace. And nobody can think for you. Nobody can do the thinking for you. You have to do it. You have to resolve yourself. You have to determine your heart to be a doer of what God has called you to do. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 15. It says that Abraham and Sarah had called to mind the country from which they had come out. They would have had opportunity to return. Look at that. If they had started thinking about the Ur of Chaldees and the family they left behind. If on their journey to the promised land, which by the way they didn't know what it was in that moment. Oh yeah, by the way, when they got there, you remember what it was? It was in a drought. But you know, in those moments, they didn't go back to we missed it. We didn't go back to what did we leave? That's what the Israelites did in the wilderness. When God delivered them in a supernatural way, what did they do? It would have been better if we'd have stayed in Egypt. What are you doing? Don't let your mind draw you back to those things. You know why? It brings opportunity to death. They would have went back. And they would have missed God. And God would have not had a covenant with those people to bring his son, Jesus, into the earth. Don't kid yourself. What you think about matters, guys. Don't let those little thoughts of doubt, those little how comes, those little buts that love to eat away at your boldness, at your confidence. You can't be tempted with what you don't think. Oh, hallelujah, I'm going to say that again. You can't be tempted with things you don't think about. The temptation comes because the thought, the image. Just think about all the things you are tempted to do because you're living on social media. You're having a conversation at dinner, and before you get home, 50 commercials have popped up on social media for the thing you were talking about. Don't tell me they aren't listening. Temptations, temptations, temptations. Things that get into your mind to get you thinking about things. That's how many of us got in debt. That's how many of us made bad choices. Because we overthought and overthought. And we found a way to get that temptation to manifestation. And in those times, often... It created such a difficulty and such a persecution and a weight and a problem we should have never had. And we think, how did we get here? I'll tell you how you got there. You started thinking about it. You started meditating on it. You started weighing it. And it, it, it created an opportunity to bring you back to a place of disobedience. Abraham never allowed his thoughts to go to the place Isaac is not returning. He would not allow himself to think Isaac is not coming off this mountain. He believed Isaac would return. And it says in verse 6 of Genesis, Abraham took the word, the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife and the two of them went together. Interesting similarity here between Jesus and Isaac. Just as Jesus carried the cross that he would die on, Isaac carries the wood that he would die on. Think about that. There there is such symbolism in what is happening here. There is such significance and meaning in every bit of this story. As much as Isaac as there is Abraham. Verse 8, Isaac spoke to Abraham and said to his father, My father, here I am, son, he said. Look, the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Notice, Abraham was not pondering this out loud with Isaac. You you are not going to believe what God is asking us to do, Isaac. He didn't talk about it. He didn't encourage him. He didn't motivate him to do it. He kept his mouth shut. He believed and he focused on his belief. He didn't counsel. He didn't advise. As proof, Isaac had no idea what we were doing. He thought we were going to make a sacrifice. Didn't realize it was him, but he went anyways. And Abraham said in verse 8, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. This is very important wording. Abraham didn't say God will provide a lamb. He said he will provide for himself 
a land. That sounds like Abraham understood the symbolisms of what was happening. He understood that God would send his son to be a lamb for us. You don't believe that? Go read Galatians 3.8. Here it says, For seeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand. Somewhere God had began to plant the understanding of what God had to do with Christ in and preached this idea to Abraham. And it says that he preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand. What's the gospel? The gospel is the story of Christ. It is the good news brought into this world. That's what we just celebrated, right? We celebrated the gospel birthed. In a, in a virgin who said yes. Again, obedience. Abraham knew. Abraham understood. In you, all the nations shall be blessed. Think about this. He's walking up this mountain with Isaac. Abraham is replaying this in his mind. Saying to himself, in you, all the nations shall be blessed. In you, all the nations shall be blessed. In John chapter 8. Verse 60, uh, 56 through 58, Jesus talking said, Your father Abraham rejoiced to, to see my day. Abraham didn't see Jesus' day. Abraham was gone for thousands of years. What is he talking about? He's talking about what Hebrews just said. He was preached the message of the gospel by God himself. Abraham rejoiced to see my day, Jesus talking. And he saw it. And was glad. Then the Jews said to him, You're not yet 50 years old. And you have seen Abraham. And Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, Before Abraham was, I am. You know Jesus was watching this entire thing happen. As Abraham was walking up the mountain. As Isaac is carrying the wood. He sees himself doing it thousands of years later with a cross. As he sees Abraham obedient to know that God would raise Isaac from the dead, Jesus knew that my own father will raise me from the dead. Are you following me? Hallelujah. Don't tell me obedience doesn't matter. I believe Abraham knew exactly what was happening. He understood the symbolism of what was happening. And the relevance of all of this to us is that the Holy Spirit helps us to see the bigger picture of what we are doing in our life. You know, if you'll stay men of faith and women of faith, if you'll stay focused on the Spirit in your mind and not be distracted, you know what will happen? The Spirit, as you walk, as you move, as you obey, the picture of what you're doing and why you're doing it, He will begin to reveal. And he will begin to unfold. And he will begin to show, show you. And you will begin to have boldness and clarity and understanding like never before. Because somewhere when God said, you put the, you put the, the saddle on the donkey and moved. You got the firewood and you left. Hallelujah. We get so lost in the moments. We get so lost in the pressure. We get so lost in the emotions of what we're doing. We miss what God is trying to do. We miss what God is doing through us. Think of how great. I think of my father. I think of my wife's father. They left their whole life. They just uprooted their whole family to go follow God. I mean, that is such, even today, 50 years later, it's still a radical idea that you would do something like that. And yet, where my life is, where my children's life, where the generations of our lives ahead of me will be because of that moment. The things you are now in right now. What is God saying to you? How will that change and alter the future of the generations ahead of you? You'll never know. Pondering it. Hesitating. Dragging your feet. Somewhere you're going to have to believe. And the Holy Spirit will make sure that your picture unfolds as you walk. As you advance. As you move forward you'll see. The goodness of God. God was using this act of Abraham to open the right of way for Christ himself to save us all. Not only, not only that. Abraham was securing the entire Gentile race. 
the opportunity to enter into the blessing. Jesus came to not only redeem the Jew, but the Gentile as well. And we got to stay focused on the plans God has for us. If God has told you to do something, you need to focus on the big picture. And as you're focusing on that, ask the Holy Spirit to show you, to guide you, to reveal to you the vastness, the greatness of the plan that God has for your life. In verse 9, it says, They came to the place in which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order, and he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. You know, Jewish historian named Josephus says Isaac was around 25 years old in this moment. Now, I don't know about you, but there's no way a 120-year-old man is going to tie up a 25-year-old kid. Somewhere there was this restraint that Isaac had in himself. It showed not only the authority that Abraham had over Isaac, but Isaac's submission. Isaac willingly, he didn't fight him. He didn't argue. You never hear him say, uh, wait a second. Uh, you said God would provide himself a lamb, not, not me. What's going on here, Dad? Nowhere do we see Isaac resistant to do. And in Genesis 18, verse 19, the Lord said that he knew Abraham would command his children after him to serve the Lord. Now, I don't know about you, but this is evidence of that faithfulness because this boy did it. This boy allowed his father to tie him up. You don't think Isaac didn't know what a sacrifice would look like? He'd seen it before. He knew what was happening. He understood it. He didn't drug him. He didn't knock him over the head. He didn't put him in some state where he didn't understand. No, authority and submission. Authority and submission. Are you all getting the picture here? Faith is not some blind thing you go through in fear. It is an authority, an understanding of an authority to do what God has called me to do. And then a submission to submit to do what God has given me power to do, even when everything in the natural says it's a bad idea. But because I know my place, because I'm a man of faith, because I understand the power of God, I will obey and I will submit. Oh, praise God. There is not such a thing as an easy walk of faith. The Bible says it's a fight. Pastor Jerry taught us faith it will put you on the edge of disaster. It's an active creative force that requires a discipline in our life. But in doing so, there is such power, there is such deliverance, there is such greatness of God and His glory manifests in the life of a person who will do what God called them to do. Remember, I'm talking about the goodness of God. I'm talking about expecting God's best. It's not blindly hoping God makes everything turn out good. It's doing the work of expectation. Obedience. Obedience. Faith, confidence, trust. That's the fight of faith. Abraham is laying out a picture of what a life of faith looks like. It's a great testimony to Abraham that he trained Isaac. And Isaac understood because Isaac and Abraham typify the Father God and Jesus his son. God the Father bound Jesus. God the Father offered his son for our sins. He didn't constrain Jesus. He didn't force Jesus. But like Isaac, Jesus willingly laid down his life. Verse 10 says, And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. He wasn't bluffing. He was killing him. Think about this. Think about this picture. Oh, it, it, it touches my heart. It, it penetrates my own life because I am so reminded that there is always that moment in a journey of faith where that big moment comes, that big thing, that raise the knife, swing the knife, do what God has said. Oh, how many times has God spoken to you? Speak into that person's life. Sow into that person's life. Sacrifice yours for the need of someone else. And you thought, yeah, I'll do it. Right up to that moment where you had to sign the paper. Right in the moment where you had to write the check. Right in the moment where you had to hand it to them. And then it's that, mm, let's pray about this a little bit longer. Let's just drag our feet another 24 hours. 
No, Abraham was committed all the way. He lifts the, the knife. And in verse 11, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. Look at this. He said the same thing at the beginning of this message. God said, take your son and sacrifice him. Here I am. Now here he is doing it. And God speaks out through the angel, which I believe is Jesus. But he says, don't lay your hand on the lad. Don't do anything to him. Watch this. Oh, it, it, it speaks to me. It should speak to you if you're living by faith. For now... I know you fear God. Is there anything in your life that would ever make a statement like that to the Lord? <laughs> Think of the things that God wants you to do. Think of the great witness God wants you to be. Think of the people that need Jesus in your life. Am I the one that's so willing to do? Am I the one that God can look down and say, now I know you fear God. For you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. I wonder how it was in that moment. I wonder what, what, what God and Jesus must have been thinking looking down at that picture. And in that moment thinking, it has taken thousands of years to get one man to this moment. Think of how God must have rejoiced in that moment. It says in 1 Samuel 15, 22. A big answer to something I always thought. Why did God need Abraham to kill Isaac? I know you're thinking it. We all think it when we read this. What's the point? Why would God need to do that? And here I, I, God brought me to this scripture and it says, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offering and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Oh, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. And to heed than the fat of rams. It wasn't about killing Isaac. Again, it was about obedience. Isaac was the tool God used to bring Abraham to a place of obedience. And that obedience, that sacrifice, opened the doorway for Jesus. God here says, I don't delight in the sacrifice. I delight in the obedience. Abraham obeyed God completely. There was nothing that God could add by having Isaac killed. Everything that God needed to happen to open the doorway to Christ happened because Abraham obeyed. It's better that he obeyed than to actually have killed Isaac. See, that's how powerful obedience is. It creates, obedience creates doorways for God's power. Obedience moves things out of the way. Obedience removes the hindrance. It removes the delay. It creates a pathway for blessing and provision. And it's all tied to what you do in your life. Verse 13 in Genesis again, Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called that place Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. Notice there was no provision until obedience was walked out. The fullness of obedience brought him to a land called Jehovah Jireh, a place of the Lord will provide. We all want a Lord providing, but are we all willing to walk the journey of obedience to get to that land of Jehovah Jireh? As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. The Strong's Concordance says Jehovah Jireh means Jehovah will see to it. Abraham had such confidence in God's ability to see to it that he could believe God would raise Isaac from the dead. If he could then do those things, how much more with us having a better covenant, this side of the cross, this side of Jesus, this side of the work of the Holy Spirit, 
with a life built on better promises, how is it that we cannot believe the same way in our situation? Are you telling me that Abraham could be greater in faith than you and I can be on this side of the cross? Redeemed, restored, in right relationship, full of the Spirit, alive in Christ. Joint heirs with Jesus. We can't walk in faith. We can't be that bold in obedience. Oh, praise God. We can. We can do it. Why? Because greater is he who lives in me than he that lives in the world. That carnal mind will not stop a spiritually minded man who believes. Verse 15 says, Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven. And said, by myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing. You did not withhold your son. Your only son. I get emotional because of Jesus. I don't get emotional because of a man thousands of years ago. But because of what it did in my life. Because it's what it's doing in your life. It's because of who Christ is. And all that he has done for mankind. Because Abraham obeyed. That's the power of obedience in our life. Think about it. God was able to do in us because of what man, one man was willing to do for God. Verse 17, blessing I will bless you. Multiplying I will multiply your descendants. As the sand and the stars of heaven which reach into the seashore and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. God's blessing. God's blessing is on the other side of obedience. Active favor manifests in the life of a person who is obedient, who expects God's best. If you look back in Genesis chapter 1, verses 22 and 28, it shows the blessing that God released on the life and the families and the words of Abraham. The words released over Abraham's life was a word of favor, a word of blessing. And that same promise is available to us. We release today favor over our lives by speaking his favor into everything we do. Everything we do, we release the favor that was purchased in Christ. And available because of this story and this moment and this act of obedience. It created an avenue where today we only have to speak favor into our life. Matthew 16, 19 tells us that Jesus promised to give us the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever we bind on earth is bound in earth. And whatever we loose in earth is loosed in heaven. Look at that. When we bind on the earth, it's bound in heaven. When we loose on the earth, it's loosed in heaven. Why? Favor. Because we have been favored. We have been given authority. Remember that authority that Abraham walked in? We've been given it in Christ. Abraham had to have God speak for the promise to manifest. Now we do the speaking. The promises are ours in Jesus. God makes it happen through Christ, but we release it through the words of our mouth. Verse 18 in Genesis again, in your seed, singular, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. This is confirmation of what I'm saying. This is not talking about Isaac. This is talking about Jesus, the singular seed of Jesus Christ will bless the entire nations of the earth. Paul said in Galatians 3.16 that this was not about Isaac, but about the one seed who is Jesus Christ. In verse 19 of Genesis it said, Abraham returned to his young men, and they rose and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. What we see through this entire story tonight is this. Is that although Abraham was willing to do as God said, it was his confidence in knowing God so well that he could expect a miracle. It wasn't just what God said. It was the confidence he had in God that God would be faithful to perform. That God would do what he said. You got to know God well enough to expect God to provide what you need. Do you know God that well? 
If you don't, there's only one way, and that's through His Word. That's through prayer. That's through study and meditation. There's no cheat sheet. There's no go to church long enough and you'll know God. There's only what you get from God in church applied in your daily life that brings you to a place of knowing and understanding and increasing the expectation of that good God working daily in your life. We've got to be the same way. We got to stop wondering how we're going to make it. We got to stop expecting God to provide for our needs without our participation. He will do what He is faithful to perform in His Word. God has promised He is faithful, and as He was to Abraham, He is always to us, His sons and daughters as well. When sickness tries to attach itself to your body, realize Jesus already paid the price for that, and by the stripes of Jesus, you are healed. 1 Peter 2.24 He bore your sin on his own body. That we having died to that sin might live through a righteous place. So that by his stripes we were past tense healed. We were healed when his body was placed on the tree. In other words, we got to begin to expect Jehovah Jireh's provision to be made on our behalf. If you tap into the realm of the relationship with God, you'll begin to see situations change. Forget what you're looking at right now and trust God. Begin to speak the promises into existence in that situation. Say things like Psalms 35, 27. Let the Lord be magnified who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. God, you delight in my prosperity. Father, I thank you that I'm out of debt because you pleasure in the prosperity of your servant. Watch. Oh, listen. What's the most important word in that whole thing? For you pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. That's you. You and I are the servants of Jesus Christ. He is our Lord and he is our master. And oh, he takes pleasure in my prosperity. Why? I'm serving him. He don't take the pleasure in the prosperity of those who ignore him, disobey him, never show up. No, no, no. They're servants. Servants are the one who prosper. Servants are the one who are blessed. Servants are the one he is well pleased with. You're going to have to keep confessing the word until the manifestation comes to pass. Here's an idea. Write the confession down. Start putting those confessions in positive places. And don't let them just become habitual statements. Let them be truths, truths, truths. Let your expectation, let your mind continually see the manifestation of that promise. Don't just see it as something God promised. See it as yours. Abraham saw Isaac raised from the dead. That's why he told Sarah, we'll be back. He didn't just say it and forget about it the whole way there. He's thinking God is faithful. God is faithful. His mind was focused. He's raising him from the dead. Write it down. Keep confessing it. And then lastly, just be patient. Calm down. Quit getting in a hurry all the time. Isaiah 40 verse 31 as we wind down tonight. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Notice this. All of these are adjectives of the journey you're taking. Your wings will mount up. You'll run and not be weary. Who does that when you're there? They walk and not faint. That's all the descriptions of what happens when I am patient on my journey. God will strengthen me. He will encourage me. He will empower me. I won't quit. I won't slow down. I won't fall into weakness. I won't faint. Praise the Lord. It's too bad you aren't in the room tonight because I'm hearing some amens through the television. Amen. If you ever could stand on something that will never fail, it is the promises of God. Abraham did it. You can do it. Your children will do it because you're a good parent who sets the standard and is an example of obedience to your young ones looking to you to trust and believe in God. God promised in Galatians 6, 9, let us not grow weary while doing good for in due season... We shall reap if we do not lose heart. When it's due, it'll come. 
When it's time for harvest, it'll manifest. God's word is your confidence. It has great recompense of reward. One more scripture, Hebrews 10, 35 and 6. Do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance. It's evidence things might get hard. He wouldn't say you have need of endurance if you didn't need it. He understands that the thing is challenging, but when you need endurance, you'll have great confidence and it'll reward your endurance so that after you have done the will of God, you receive the promise. Did you see that? Confidence and endurance, doing the will of God, brings the receiving of the promise. Everything I've said tonight is requiring something of us. Participation. Mind, soul, spirit, it's doing it all the way. And so tonight as I close, I just remind you of this important point. Jehovah Jireh's provision is available and should be seen in our life. Not just once in a while, but in everything we do. Every act of obedience, we see Jehovah Jireh in our horizon. We see the promise of God's goodness manifest in our life. He'll see it done. He'll do what he is faithful to do. Yes, difficult times cause people sometimes to forget. They forget about God's ability. They forget about God's willingness. And many times we find ourselves getting attentive to the wrong things. Rather than God's word, we're focusing on the plan B. The what if this don't work, at least we have a backup. No, no, no. That's a mistake. Abraham did not have an alternative. He couldn't take one of his slave sons to be sacrificed. It had to be his only son. Luke 137 says, For with God nothing will be impossible. You know, you should lock that truth into your mind. With God nothing is impossible. With God nothing is impossible. Get obedient tonight. Make a decision. Guarantee that God's best will manifest in your life if you'll do what you're called to do. Expect God's goodness. Expect God's best. Like Abraham, see it in your mind. See it in your heart. Keep moving forward. God is faithful to perform that which he has called you to do in your life. Trust him. Expect God's best. Amen. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you. For the power of your word. Thank you for the demonstration of your power in our heart tonight. Oh, let the spirit and the anointing of this message penetrate deep into the core of our heart. Help us in our resolve and determination to be men and women of focused minds. Doing of your word. Believing in your word. Faithful to your word. Trusting in your word. For we know that as you were faithful to Abraham, you are faithful to us. For we are the bride of Christ. We are joint heirs with Jesus. We are your favorite sons and daughters. And as we obey, we hold fast to the truth of the promised land of Jehovah Jireh. You are a faithful God and you perform and deliver and you manifest your promises in our life. And we thank you that this coming year is a year of blessing. A year of increase, a year of obedience, a year of discipline in our own lives. To be men and women of faithfulness in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you for watching tonight. Before I let you go, I just want to thank you for your obedience. As we said at the beginning of this message, if you'd like to give tonight, you can do that online through the electronic ways. You can also mail your tithe in. However you'd like to be faithful to give, we encourage you to do that. And because of that, as I close tonight, I want to close this message by a prayer again for your seed. And as you have been faithful to give and to sow, we want to receive it in the faith in which you give it tonight. Uh, one more reminder before I do that. Sunday morning, Sunday night this week, we have a great set of services as we close out 2023. We're going to end the year praying together. So we invite you to come 6 o'clock on Sunday night. And let's spend some time praying for the new year, for your lives, for God's goodness. The things that we heard tonight, we're going to spend some time praying the manifestation in the spirit over those things that happen. 
So let me pray for your giving tonight. Thank you for being here. Thank you for watching tonight. We sure love you guys, and we are so looking forward to seeing you again. But Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for these men and women as they have been so faithful to sow and to give. Father, take notice of their obedience. Take notice of their faith. Take notice of that seed they give tonight. And we receive it in which the faith that they have given from faith to faith produces faith rewards. And what's that? Everything after its own kind. So we proclaim and we declare and we receive and we fix our mind on the Jehovah Jireh that is our God. That you are providing increase on every wave. That the land of provision is theirs as they obey and give tonight in Jesus mighty name and we ask for your mercy and your grace and your blessing to go on to them into this new year thank you father for the gift of jesus thank you father for your goodness manifest in our lives in jesus mighty name amen we love you guys we'll see you on sunday be blessed hey thanks for watching make sure you click like and subscribe to this channel so you can catch all our videos and live streams Hey, why don't you share one of these videos with your friends? And remember, you can catch me live every Sunday morning and Wednesday evening. Thanks for watching. This is our finest hour to set men free.